welcome everyone and welcome back to our keynote session of our two-day symposium, Thought for Food and the Lucille Hispanic Cancer Project. I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes to introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Rebecca Earl. Dr. Earl is an absolute recognized leader and scholar of food history and cultural history of Spanish America and also early modern Europe. Specifically, Dr. Earl explores how ordinary, everyday cultural practices, such as eating and dressing, and she even notes on her website, uh, licking a postage stamp, or uh, using postage stamps, uh, shape how we think about the world. For students here today, I'll begin with an introduction of our extraordinary speaker with her life as an undergraduate. After majoring in math, so I'll just stem people out there. <laughs> And graduating summa cum laude from Bryn Mawr College, Dr. Earl was awarded a Marshall Scholarship to pursue graduate study in England. So if any student want to talk to her about that. Uh, where she did go for a master's and PhD in history at the University of Warren. She later held a series of lectureships and other full-time appointments before being promoted to professor uh, in the Department of History, where she currently serves as chair of the department. Her first book, Spain and the Independence of Colombia, explains the collapse of Spanish colonialism in the early 19th century Colombia. Subsequent work took on greater time spans and broader geographies. For example, in her second monograph, The Return of the Native, Dr. Earl offers, offers a hemispheric interpretation of elite nationalism in post-colonial Spanish America, based not only on written text, but also visual and material culture. Her third <coughs> book, which is featured upstairs at our uh, library exhibit uh, for, uh, created for this symposium, the award-winning Body of the Conquistador, garnered her international recognition. In it, Earl explores how food and eating shaped the experience of colonialism, once again drawing from a broadly hemispheric perspective. In addition to these individual book projects, Dr. Earl is the editor of three collections and special editions, over three dozen peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, recipient of dozens of awards, fellowships, prizes, and grants, and by all counts, her scholarship is outstanding. Perhaps what Dr. O is best known for is her recent and cultural work and current work on the cultural significance of the potato. And I just wanted to show you uh, two items here today. Uh, the first one is her two-part book project, the first part, Potato, that came out with Bloomsbury Press, and the second part, The Politics of the Potato, which is under co current contract with Cambridge University Press as well as some of her recent articles, such as Promoting Potatoes in 18th Century Europe and Potatoes in the Hispanic Enlightenment. All of these trace the history of the potato from its point of origin in, anyone? America. The South American Andes, Peru, <laughs> right? To its ubiquitous present presence in virtually all parts of the world. Earl's scholarship contextualizes how food in the 18th century became central to the exercise of political power. It makes evident how thinking about potatoes is a way of understanding the dramatic changes in ideas about population, political economy, and the state ushered in by the Enlightenment. She's also the creator of the exhaustive online forum, The Potato Project, and that's the second thing I want to show you today, that focuses on two interconnected questions. Number one, how quickly and by what routes did the potato spread around the world in the decades and centuries after Europeans first laid eyes on the tuber in the mid 16th century? And number two, why did states across 18th century Europe begin to promote the cultivation and consumption of the potato? Today in her talk, Spaniards, Cannibalism, and the Eucharist in the New World, Dr. Earl will share with us her current research on how European colonial discourse viewed, reported, distorted, invented indigenous cultures. Her project sheds light on how we can consider the broad rhetoric of, of colonial power in conjunction with the most sacred of Catholic practices, transubstantiation. Dr. Earl will push us to consider whether eating human flesh was something that set Amer Indians apart from European Catholics, or was, in fact, 
something that united us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Bell this afternoon. by this generous introduction that I, I think the only thing I can do is start my paper. <laughs> um, oh, do you want to wish we put it back here? Thank you. Does that work? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just speechless, really. Thank you. Yeah, so the, I think all I could do is, is is that what I was, was here to say? Thank you all very much for giving me this opportunity to 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 talk. Um, so I, you know what the title is, and I want to start by reminding you of something that I think many of you know, which is that a recurrent feature of Spanish colonial discourse in the early modern era was the lament that native peoples from Florida to Patagonia suffered from two grave defects. They were hopeless drunks, and they were prone to cannibalism. And examples of these sorts of allegations are absolutely legion. Drunkenness, insisted one 17th century writer, maybe I have this on a slide, is such a common vice among Indians that you scarcely find a single one who, having some wine or chicha, which is what they usually drink, does not get drunk. And colonial complaints about drunkenness were unrelenting throughout the colonial period, and they continued to form a standard element of post-colonial Creole discourse as well. Drunkenness, these sorts of comments make clear, were considered by settlers to be a characteristic indigenous vice. So that's one thing. Second, from Columbus's arrival in the Caribbean in 1492, European colonists and settlers consistently associated cannibalism with the New World. And as many scholars have shown, Columbus at first vacillated on whether the people that he encountered in the Caribbean were civilized subjects of the great Khan, and that in fact he had reached Japan, or whether on the other hand they were you know, man-eating cynocephali. Although Columbus was not quite sure about these things and vacillated back and forth, the consensus pretty quickly emerged among Europeans that these newly discovered by Europeans lands were a zone of man-eating individuals. The association between cannibalism and the Caribbean was particularly strong. Amerigo Vespucci, for example, reported, reported completely matter-of-factly in 1503 that Caribbean Peoples slaughter those who are captured, and the victors eat the vanquished, for human flesh is an ordinary article of food among them. Chroniclers of all regions reported very carefully on whether the inhabitants of that region did or did not eat human flesh, and the fear of being eaten permeates many conquest narratives. You can see Europeans interpreting all sorts of things as being evidence that people perhaps are interested in, in eating them. And the association between the Indies and cannibalism was immortalized in popular prints and theatrical works such as The Tempest in the very word cannibal itself. And we have many examples of these sorts of associations. Um, as Carlos Jauregui, who is it who knows Carlos Jauregui? Yeah, you're his, yeah, you're his, as, as, as he describes in his wonderful and authoritative cultural history of the New World Cannibal, as, as he put it, Europeans found anthropophagites everywhere, creating a sort of semantic affinity between cannibalism and America. So in short, it's clear that for many colonists and colonial writers, Drunkenness and cannibalism, like sodomy, you know, a whole series of other um, failings, were part of a spectrum of what were considered to be distinctive behaviors associated with indigenous people, which showed them to be, in the view of Europeans, quite different from and almost certainly inferior to their colonizers. Now, many of the interpretive routes that we can follow to explain this web of associations have already been mapped out very clearly. There's a vast body of scholarship that, 
that works on this, and you know, to, um, to which I just want to allude very, very briefly. I mean, it's evident to begin with that the claims that indigenous peoples were cannibals, it's clear that that forms part of a larger colonizing discourse that worked to dismiss indigenous peoples as unfit for self-government. And that's, that's quite clear, I think. And that, that, that process itself drew on long-standing European tendencies of locating aberrant behavior in distant or marginal locations. The pioneering research of scholars such as William Ahrens and Peter Hume have shown that the discovery of cannibals in the New World can't be separated from the process of colonization that brought Europeans there in the first place. Cannibals, in a sense, were a necessary part of colonial space. Europeans had to find cannibals in the Americas if they were going to colonize it. And many other scholars have similarly linked charges of both cannibalism and drunkenness to wider dismissals of indigenous rationality and to justifications of colonial violence. So that much we know, I think. And I think that's, that's been well established. Now, those sorts of ideas also inform a related body of scholarship that considers whether, that considers the following question, whether European colonial discourse, whatever its motivation, whether it in fact accurately captures any aspect of indigenous culture at all, right? So there's quite a bit of research that asks how and whether we can use colonial writings to try to excavate the lived realities of real indigenous people in the past. So in particular, scholars have tried to be reading you know, through this colonial discourse to ask whether cannibalism or particular ways of using alcohol did in fact characterize indigenous society and culture. And there's a big debate about whether one can do this. So there's a rich scholarship, in other words, that associates accusations of drunkenness and cannibalism um, within broader analyses of Spanish justification for colonialism, and also a rich body of scholarship that tries to highlight the dilemmas that scholars must confront when they try to disentangle Spanish rhetoric from indigenous reality. So all of that, I think, is, you know, is material that I just want to remind you of. But there's also another context into which we can place early modern discussions of drunkenness and cannibalism. And that is the Christian sacrament of communion. Communion, after all, entails the, I mean, let us say, the mediated consumption of wine and the mystical ingestion of divine made human flesh. And the centrality of the Eucharist to Reformation debates about Christian doctrine is reflected in the colonial church's sustained attention to this sacrifice, sacrament. And it's clear that the mass was not just one of many Iberian practices that colonizers hoped to implant in the Indies. It was a fundamental element of early modern Catholic identity and belief. And many scholars have explored the varied efforts that missionaries made in the 16th and 17th centuries to translate this sacrament to the Indies. And these efforts, of course, were never separate from the hierarchies that structured colonial society more generally. So for example, discussions of whether indigenous people could comprehend the mystery of transubstantiation were both informed and informed by the alleged irrationality of indigenous people and the alleged inability of indigenous people to govern themselves. Those ideas, those Spanish ideas, resonated back and forth with European debates about whether indigenous peoples could participate in this sacrament, whether they could take communion, etc. Celebrations of the communion service of Corpus Christi as well marked out indigenous peoples as incomplete Christians, a bit you know, like the conversos we were hearing about earlier on, even as they also provided spaces 
for indigenous peoples themselves to insist upon their own status as members of the communion of saints. So there's, it's clear that the sacrament of the mass was a very important element of the larger package of cultural and social practices that were being transferred to the Indies with Spanish colonialism. So I think that to understand the meaning of of indigenous drunkenness and cannibalism within Spanish colonial discourse, to make sense of that, we need to consider not only their relationship to broad rhetorics of colonial power, but also to the very specific early modern debates about this most sacred of Catholic sacraments. And by charting out the relationship between bread and wine, and flesh and blood. We can gain, I think, a richer understanding of colonial imaginations and also what it meant when settlers accused indigenous peoples of being drunkards or cannibals. For colonial writers, the distance that separated indigenous people from Spaniards could be measured precisely in the difference between, a, you know, the distance between a drunken cannibal and a sober Catholic. But these differences were fragile, and the distance was perhaps not quite as great as colonists would have desired. And so my ultimate aim in, in the talk I want to give you now is to highlight what I think is a central feature of all colonial regimes. That, that is the anxiety felt by colonists, as, as Kate Telcher put it, the, as she put it, this fundamental sense of colonial insecurity which can rarely be allowed direct expression, but which keeps surfacing to be repeatedly allayed. So I ultimately want to talk about this colonial anxiety and how we can think about it by thinking about it in relationship to these ideas about drunkenness and, and cannibalism. So let's start with distance. Let's start with the idea that there's a vast distance right, between sober Catholics and drunken cannibals. Let's, let's think about that. And to understand that, we need to begin with the Spanish diet. And because food, as, as much as religion, lies at the heart of early modern discussions of both drunkenness and cannibalism. So for Spanish Catholics, bread and wine represented the very essence of their Catholic identity. And they also represented the, the sine qua non of bodily health. The consumption of earthly bread and wine ensured corporeal health, and the heavenly bread and wine of the mass ensured that of the soul. Now, that bread and wine were healthy is beyond doubt. Right? I mean, that was absolutely without, you know, that was, that was unquestionable from the point of view of early modern dietetics. Wheat bread was a basic foodstuff, more suited to humans than bread from any other grain as one early modern writer put it. Wheat bread occupied a significant place within humoral theory, which we've been hearing about this morning, because it was generally held to be the most nutritious food and agglutinated best to the body, and was therefore best suited to the you know, building human flesh. And wine, in turn, was an, a medical necessity, which is a nice idea, no? <laughs> um, to, I mean, in a quote I'm particularly fond of from, from the early 16th century, one colonial writer put it, um, maybe I'll put this on a slide, to deprive an old man or a youth of a little wine is to send him straight to the grave. Yeah? So early modern texts are full of celebrations of wine, which is praised for its healthfulness, its medicinal effects, provided its drunken moderation, right? Immoderate consumption came in for universal criticism. Examples from the Bible, Lot, and Noah were frequently cited. But most writers agreed, most Spanish writers, actually most European writers agreed, that Spaniards were less prone to the vice of drunkenness than any other European. Spaniards boasted of their moderation, which they regarded as absolutely proverbial. More importantly than all this, wheat flour and grape wine were the symbols of Christianity itself. They were the substance that, through the mystery of the Mass, were conformed, transformed into the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. Indeed, they were the only substances capable 
of undergoing this transformation. From the Middle Ages, church doctrine required that communion be celebrated using only wheat bread and grape wine. That is, in fact, still the case. A problem for celiacs, but that's a whole other topic. Um, and these substances were therefore essential to the execution of the most important of Catholic mysteries. Indeed, bread and wine were in some ways fungible, and they were really, you know, essentially the same thing, because the Catholic, the, the Council of Trent it's determined that Christ was fully present in both elements of the Mass. So, so to sum up the point, what point am I trying to make? Bread and wine represented for Spaniards both the idealized, healthful diet that they aspired to eat and the very essence of Christianity in their potential to become the body and blood of Christ. Now, indigenous peoples, in contrast, appeared to Spaniards to possess an entirely dysfunctional relationship with these two basic foodstuffs. Everything was the reverse of what it should be. As regards alcohol, far from being healthful as it was for Spaniards, wine was declared positively lethal for indigenous people. Many Spanish writers insisted that the terrible mortality that afflicted native peoples after the arrival of Europeans was due in part to the failure of indigenous people to drink in moderation. The same wine that ensured the bodily health of Europeans was lethal to the indigenous body. So I refer just to give you a few examples. Giving alcohol to Indians has the effect of killing them off, insisted one Spanish, one Mexican viceroy. Everyone knows, commented another, that this drink destroys the health and kills them. So wine is medicinal for Europeans. It's a poison for indigenous people. Moreover, while the Christian mass involved the sober and moderate consumption of wine, actually no consumption of wine at all, it's drunk by the priest in the early modern period, in fact. So it involves the priest's sober and moderate consumption of wine. Indigenous religious festivals were condemned as little more than drunken orgies. The 16th century a chronicler from New Granada, Juan Rodriguez Fraile, for instance, alleged that these sorts of events, indigenous religious ceremonies, were nothing more than great drinking sprees. Getting drunk was, in the view of the Jesuit priest, Jose de Acosta, their principal cult and religion. So for Europeans, indigenous drinking, which led inevitably to drunkenness, was also linked to idolatry, to which indigenous people were considered to be all too prone in the first place. This was why drunkenness was, in the words of yet another Jesuit, the ancient root of idolatry. Now, for all of these reasons, settlers should under no circumstances sell wine, let alone spirits, to indigenous people because of the serious harm that ensures that ensues to both their bodies and their souls. So accessing wine is just opening the door to idolatry. So for indigenous people, from the point of view of Europeans, drinking was fundamentally incompatible with Christianity and corporeal well-being. While for Spaniards, it was a source of physical and spiritual health. And this unhealthy relationship with alcohol led a number of colonial writers to conclude that indigenous people should be excluded from taking communion whatsoever. Catholic doctrine prohibited administering communion to individuals while they were drunk. Right? I mean, there were specific instructions saying you can't give communion to somebody who's drunk. And it seems that many priests believed that indigenous people were so often drunk that they should be excluded from taking communion as a matter of course. Now, people who at the time opposed this exclusionary practice pointed out that since taking communion was necessary for salvation, to deny indigenous peoples the right to take communion was to deny them salvation. So this ability, or this, let's say this inability to consume alcohol properly, possibly resulted in the total exclusion of indigenous peoples from the Christian community, from this perspective, right? So a failure to drink properly 
led to an exclusion from the community of saints altogether. Now, this problematic relationship between indigenous peoples and the Eucharist extended beyond the matter of, of drunkenness. Because far worse, while Catholics worshipfully receive the body of Christ, you know, in a, in a communion wafer, Amerindians were thought to indulge in the terrible and all too real earthly sin of you know, real cannibalism. Many colonial writers were horrified by the similarities that they perceived between indigenous cannibalism and the sacrament of communion. The fact that prior to the arrival of Europeans, a number of indigenous groups had, in fact, engaged in forms of ritual cannibalism was seen by many colonial writers as a demonically inspired imitation or sort of parody of the Christian mass intended precisely to mock the Eucharist. So for example, in discussing the um, Mexica pra practice of, of sacrifice and, com and cannibalism, the Dominican priest, um, Diego Duran, for example, commented, note how well this devilish ceremony counterfeits that of our holy church that commands us to receive the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And colonial writers disputed the precise origins of this horrifying similarity. Or was this the devil making fun of, of, of Christianity? Was it something that had been deliberately planted in the Indies as a way of laying foundations for subsequent evangelization? You know, whatever it was about, um, whatever it was, it was certainly something that was seen as being a kind of inverse version of the proper form of ingesting body and blood. And indeed, all of this then linked cannibalism again back tightly to idolatry within colonial rhetoric. In fact, as the historian Jorge Canizales as Guerra observed, cannibalism became a key marker of demonic activity for colonial writers. So in sum, again, to summarize the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here, the appropriate consumption of alcohol in the form of grape wine and the appropriate consumption of flesh in the form of a transubstantiated communion wafer lay at the center of Catholic orthodoxy and sensible self-management that Spanish settlers in the New World aspired to represent. Indigenous people, in contrast, were said to be characterized by their inability to engage appropriately with this solemn activity and these most helpful of foods. Their defining vices serve precisely to differentiate them from their Catholic colonizers. So colonial writers indeed stress that the coming of colonialism simultaneously brought an end to idolatry and to cannibalism because these two things were seen as being practically synonymous. They were effectively the same thing. So if you end idolatry, you end cannibalism. After all, as the learned jurist Juan de Solorzano y Ferreira noted in a very lengthy tome of colonial legislation from the 17th century, it was perfectly justifiable to conquer people who ate human flesh, were drunkards, and engaged in sodomy. He specifically listed those things. And all of that made it perfectly OK to conquer and colonize someone. So you can see, in other words, how all of these things are tightly linked together in colonial rhetoric. And yet, and yet, the boundaries that were created by colonialism were never quite so stable as to allow sharp demarcations between colonizers and colonized or between the faithful and those who were beyond redemption. As the historian Marcy Norton has observed, settlers in the Indies were never sure that they could maintain a Christian and European identity in a colonial milieu. Nor was there really any consensus that indigenous peoples were incommensurably, irredeemably different 
from Europeans. And after all, bringing Christianity to the Indies was the central justification of Spain's colonial endeavor, as Spaniards insisted over and over and over again. That's why they were there, so they claim. And the idea that Amerindians could never truly become Christians was troubling both doctrinally and morally. Spaniards, in fact, debated the indigenous aptitude for Christianity. Many argued that indigenous peoples had precisely the same capacity for faith as did Europeans, precisely those disputes about whether Jews could ever truly become Catholics that we were referring to a, a, you know, earlier this afternoon were, were replicated in the Indies and regarding the capacity of indigenous people to become true Christians. So, and colonial rhetoric could not fail to reflect these, these anxieties and ambiguities. The very discourse of cannibalism that seemed to mark out so distinctly the differences between Spaniards and Indians, in fact, demonstrates the diaphanous nature of all of these divisions. Because it was never quite as evident as Spanish settlers might have desired whether they were really all that different from New World cannibals. Despite the rhetorical efforts to situate cannibalism solely in the Indies, despite the efforts to say that this was some sort of new world phenomenon, which I mean, was a process that was certainly underway already in the 16th century, despite all of these efforts, settlers were uncomfortably aware that Europe, too, had its cannibals. And an older European scholarship once tried to claim that cannibalism didn't occur in any culturally significant way in Europe. I mean, you can still find some you know, works by scholars that, you know, that claim that, that try to claim that cannibalism was not culturally significant in Europe. In fact, cannibalism was present in many different cultural arenas in early modern Europe. Literature, folklore, and of course in the mass itself, it was constantly discussed and represented. And its presence wasn't purely symbolic. There is ample evidence that Europeans engaged in cannibalism in a variety of contexts in the early modern period. Indeed, Spanish texts from the 16th and 17th century discussed explicitly the circumstances under which it was and was not acceptable for Europeans to eat human flesh. Uh, in cases of extreme hunger, for example, certainly justified cannibalism from the point of view of many theologians. And medical need, too, was considered to be a perfectly legitimate grounds for engaging in cannibalism. Stories of cannibalism during sieges and during famines were legion. I mean, here are a few illustrations. And so there are many, many such stories that one can find. Peruse this for a minute or two. And the consumption of body parts was also an established tool within both academic and folk medicine, as you know, as you may know, right? The consumption of what was called mummia, which was exactly what it sounds like, right? Bits of mummy, yeah? Um, was, you know, was a part of the European pharmacopoeia. Here you can see some containers restoring mummy up. Sorry? I just think of hair and fingernails. Well, that's true, too. Yes, one can consider whether eating is, whether, yes, is that what you call it? Auto-cannibalism. But anyway, so I mean, I, I won't, I won't, one, I won't belabor this point, but um, the, the, you know, medical practice itself justified the consumption of, of human body parts, something that not all doctors thought was a good idea. But, and the ongoing wars of religion in early modern Europe provided also provided contemporaries with ample examples of cannibalism's currency as a technique of revenge and terror. There's good scholarship on the use of cannibalism during the French wars of religion, for example. Now, the uncomfortable existence of cannibalism in early modern Europe, and specifically in Spain, has led some scholars to argue that early modern Spaniards' efforts to focus on New World cannibalism, rather than confront head-on at what one scholar calls the unfought known of European cannibalism, was you know, an attempt to sublimate 
this uncomfortable reality from Europe into a discourse of you know, rejection and differentiation, a sort of fictional sublimation of a historical record that resisted complete erasure. You couldn't completely wipe out this story, but you could focus on positioning cannibalism as being something that actually happened way over there with those, those other people. Yeah? In reality, as the anthropologist Tom Cummins put it, eating a human body was a practice shared by Spaniards and Indians. And this common history is apparent at many levels of the colonial archive. I mean, one can think about these sorts of representing these symbolic representations. Here's an illustration from um, Bartolomé de las Casas' um, denunciation of Spanish rule, where you can see Spaniards. Oh, here, I'm going to use this little pointy thing, right? Or will I? the red line. Ah, right there. You can see a Spaniard with a little, you little know, market stall selling human flesh, mm -hmm. yeah, which is being you know, prepared here, but it's a Spaniard who's selling it. Right? You see a little rock under that? Um, but the presence of European cannibalism in the Indies wasn't just at the level of symbol. It wasn't just like, it wasn't just people saying, they were like ravening wolves, those Spaniards. Um, very concretely, colonial sources admitted that Spanish settlers ate both indigenous people and each other. Uh, I mean, a few examples will suffice. The Franciscan friar Pedro Simon, for instance, described in his early 17th century chronicle how Spaniards who were following the conquistador Ambrosio Alfinger killed and ate their indigenous porters in Venezuela. One man even ate a penis, which Simon condemned as disgusting and obscene, but he thought it was worth recording. Um, he, however, noted that if one were suffering from great hunger, it was quite acceptable to eat those who were already dead. The German soldier Felipe von Hutten recounted that, contrary to nature, another Christian in Venezuela had, quote, cooked part of a boy together with some vegetables. A Francisco Lopez de Gomera's history of the conquest recorded not only the names of Spaniards who killed and ate Amerindians, Diego Gomez and Juan de Ampudia from Ajofrin, but also Spaniards killed and eaten by their compatriots, Hernán Darius from Seville, Hernando de Esquivar from Badajoz. Right? So you know, he lists precisely who they were. This shared history of cannibalism, which undermines the rigorous distinction between pious Catholics and idolatrous cannibals, intruded into the very sphere where this distinction appeared to manifest itself most strongly. That's to say, the Catholic mass. The very rites that Spanish settlers viewed as the antithesis of cannibalism proved immensely problematic for colonial writers bent on differentiating Spaniards from Indians. European theological and devotional writings offered little help in distinguishing between Christian ritual and indigenous atrocity. As the historian Merrill Llewellyn Price has observed, Anxieties about cannibalism can never be completely absent in a symbolic and literal act of eating and drinking the blood of a sacrificial victim. Right? I mean, after all, the materiality, the reality of the Eucharistic miracle had for centuries been a central element of theological discourse. Many medieval accounts describe communion wafers that became a little child or a hunk of raw flesh or that bled. I mean, here are some illustrations of an attempt at desecrating the host, and you can see a little wafer bleeding right there. Images of Christ as a mystic wine press, pressing his own body into the, the juice that becomes the wine that's served in the mass were, were common both in Europe and in the Indies as well. Here you can see two examples of Christ as a wine press. Right, you know, crushing himself into, into um, the juice to become wine. And the Reformation prompted a proliferation of questions about the mechanics of transubstantiation. Early modern Christians wanted to know, was Christ's body present in all hosts at all moments, you know, everywhere? They wanted to know whether taking communion caused 
Christ bodily pain? Did he suffer when you ate his body? And in the face of Protestant doubts, and in some cases, in the face of pointed Protestant accusations that what the Catholics were doing was exactly cannibalism, if that's what they really thought was happening during the Mass, in the face of all of this, the Council of Trent devoted considerable energy to explicating the implications of transubstantiation you know, on this sort of level. The Council of Trent stressed, for example, that all parts of the consecrated host left over after the completion of communion contain the body of Christ. All of them, not just the bits that were eaten by communicants. It didn't just happen in the mouth, for example. Um, and Tridentine texts were very explicit about the physical nature of transubstantiation. And here's an example from one missile. Let your body, Lord, which I have eaten, and your blood, which I have drunk, adhere to my viscera. So it runs one missile from 1570. And New World texts from the Indies were no less explicit. So here's another example from one such account. Do you eat the flesh of the Son and drink the blood of the Son of Man? Or the confessional text asks. Priests praised the great delicacy which is the body of Christ. And these ideas were carefully rendered into indigenous languages to allow indigenous peoples to appreciate them fully. Bilingual doctrinas or primers in Christian teaching scrupulously translated the central features of Catholic belief, including transubstantiation, into Zapotec, Nahuatl, a host of other tongues. So Spaniard and Catholic, usually antithetical and you know, supposedly inviolable, invi you know, inviolable categories, approached each other in the very rituals that supposedly distinguished them most clearly. Well, so to conclude, I will just try to, to end, yeah, because that's time, okay. Um, so was eating human flesh something that set indigenous people apart from Catholics? Or was it something that united them? The unstable frontiers between colonizers and colonized are revealed with striking clarity, I think, in the inability of colonial discourse to maintain a sharp distinction between this apparently most emblematic of differences. Now, if there are many reasons why cannibalism might serve not only to separate, but also to unite Spaniards and the indigenous populations. And without a doubt, the inherently exploitative nature of colonial relationships makes cannibalism a potent metaphor for colonialism which is why we find it in many other different colonial settings as well. And just to stick to Spanish America for a minute, it wasn't just a metaphor that was powerful for Europeans. In 17th century Paraguay, the Guarani supposedly suspected that the ordinary food of the Jesuits who corralled them into missions was human flesh. And the Indian peoples in 18th century Peru, for example, apparently viewed Spaniards as pistacos, as fearful beings who sucked the fat out of indigenous bodies. I've been unable to find any colonial images of pistacos. You'll have to accept this <laughs> modern film as a kind of illustration of the, the pistaco. But the vampiric colonist has proved an act symbol of, let's say, neo-colonial relationships in many different settings. And these stories, the, um, the scholar Louise White has noted, are ways of talking about colonial power. And as White noted, the nuances and specificities of these different stories about the European or the settler or the neo-colonizer as a vampire, as a cannibal, the nuance and specificity of these stories reflect the specificity of different colonial settings. And in the case I've been talking about here, in the case of early modern Spanish America, the Reformation, with its explicit questioning of the very essence of the Eucharist, this endowed this already vivid metaphor with particular relevance, I think, in 
early modern Spanish America. Spanish colonization occurred at a moment when the very unity of Christendom was being reconceptualized in fundamental ways. Christian doctrine seemed no more capable of uniting colonizers and colonized into a single category than it was of bringing harmony to disputing factions in Europe itself. In a treatise on evangelizing Amerindians, the Jesuit Jose de Acosta defended the capacity of indigenous people to receive Christian doctrine. He was one of the people who thought indigenous people had every capacity to become, to become Christian. He defended it by their, their capacity in the following words. He insisted that indigenous people hunger avidly for the body of Christ. Now, in the same years, uh, maybe I'll put this on a slide. Yeah? Just think about that. Okay. In the very same years, priests were told to quiz indigenous parishioners on the following question, whether you ever eat human flesh cooked with maize, for that is a great and shocking sin. Right? So hungering avidly for the body of Christ is the essence of Christianity. Eating flesh cooked with maize is a great and shocking sin. And officials elsewhere, and for this example, I'm indebted to Gregorio, a very, a very lovely book, which I, I, um, actually wasn't upstairs. Officials in New Granada instructed a local landowner that her indigenous workforce should be reminded not to eat human flesh. Tell them, she was advised, maybe I put this on, this is all up here, tell them that they must not eat human flesh because the Christians who do this suffer great torments. So colonialism aimed to ensure that Amerindians hungered avidly for the body of Christ, but for no other flesh. And what of those Christians who from time to time eat human flesh and suffer great torments? Well, what of them? Well, they had best keep quiet about it. A 16th century guide for missionaries warned that if any such missionary found himself compelled by great hunger to eat human flesh while he was out evangelizing among Amerindians, they were advised, upon returning to the company of the faithful, he should say nothing, since it could happen that the Christians would expel him from their community, as I understand sometimes happens here. Well, on such fragile bulwarks did colonial settlers rely in their attempts to differentiate themselves from those they governed. Thank you very much. You mean an indigenous culture, for example, among the, the, the Aztec and the Mexica, mm -hmm. for example? Well, in some ways, I would I should probably turn, there are probably greater authorities on this, but there are, my, my understanding was that this was considered to be a signal honor, to be chosen to represent a deity and subsequently be sacrificed. Now, what, what it means to choose to, I mean, I guess one could also turn to psychologists and say, what is choice? What does it mean to choose to do something? Some of the people who were being sacrificed were certainly not choosing anything. So some of the people who in some of the grand ceremonies that were carried out to, um, what do you call it, to inaugurate you know, the, great, the, new, the great temple in Mexico City where I forget how many tens of thousands of people were sacrificed. Many of those were people who had been captured in war. They had no choice about it. They weren't being chosen. Some of them might be symbolically eaten. They certainly had no choice. Some of the people who engaged in impersonating or be, you know, becoming deities perhaps were exercising some degree of agency and choice. Or there were not all sacrifices and, and acts of consumption were the same. If that answers that, I don't know if I'd open that up to other people who don't know. Yeah. 
thank you very much. It was a wonderful paper. I, out of curiosity, I, I wonder why you chose to leave out the, because in all the chronicles of the New World, they accused the Indians of being a drunkard, cannibals, and, and, uh, sodomite. So why you chose to, to, because it will take your, your work in, 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 into a very interesting direction because it will bring, uh, it will bring into the equation the notion of gender also. If, if we, if, right? I don't know. So why you chose to, to leave the, the accusation of sodomy against the Indians, which was uh, perhaps thrown at them as often as, as the other two? Mm -hmm. I guess I, I think that it is, I think there's a threesome of, of accusations or insults, let's say, against indigenous peoples. And I, I see, I, from my reading of the sources, sodomy was, was a third. It wasn't a trinity. I, I mean, from my reading, I see it was a, a, the drunkenness and cannibalism as the two fundamentals. And sodomy is sort of, you know, is a further failing. I wouldn't, you know, I, I would accept that one could dispute that. But that's how I read the sources. That's how I read the, the proliferation of accusations. And so that sort of got me thinking about what is this about? What do these things represent? And then I think, OK, there's a, a, there's a, a set of resonances. But I, you're right that thinking about sodomy as well augments the story of what's going on. How would you, how would you do this if you were working in sodomy in terms of not just saying, oh, and in addition, well, um, I don't know, out of the top of my head, the notion that uh, Christian identity is based on, on drinking uh, wine and eating bread, it could also be, uh, you know, if you take, if we, if we see the opposite side, it would be an identity that values heterosexual uh, Sex as opposed to celebrated sex, so it will give this. Uh, 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 it will bring into the equation a, a, a notion of heteronormal gender dynamics. But this is something that I thought while you were talking. So I don't know. Oh, I think this is one for more. Just one, as they say, for a glass of wine afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just gonna. I think it's uh, maybe they're all relating to generation of the body and the generation of the person. Person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. thinking of the thing myself. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about how communion was seen as, uh, well, the Catholic communion was the literal transformation of the wine, wine, blood, and blood. Um, that the experience with the cannibalism, is that, I know that it's another area of Christianity where the bread is just a uh, symbol of what it is. Is the cannibalism like something that attributed to the change of the um, little to the small? Yeah, so this was one of the things that was at the absolute heart of the whole process of the Reformation in Europe with the rise of Protestantism, that Protestants rejected this Catholic idea that some real transformation was taking place during the communion service. And they, they said, no, this is a symbolic consumption of the body and blood of Christ. It's not real. It's not really happening. And Protestants during the 16th century were absolutely explicit in accusing Catholics of, by their own logic, being cannibals. And so you know, they very explicitly said, well, if that's what you really think is happening during the Mass, then what you're doing is a form of cannibalism. So I mean, that very debate was absolutely live in the 16th century. And so you're, it's exactly as you say. Did you enjoy it? Well, I was thinking maybe you should uh, add uh, a, a standard of the uh, the Jesuits of early seventies. And the wall. Because when he's telling about what the black people believes is gonna happen with them when they in Africa, one of the things is they they are gonna be equal. 
or Francisco Martin made a statement in front of a um, scribano about all his experience. I mean, it's not only what my favorite from says, but it's his, his own tale. And I, I really will tell you. And one final thing. Sodomy is not always homosexual. They, they, they have three kinds of sodomy. Perfect, imperfect, Perfect is between man and woman, so, uh, and they say the uh, Indians do a lot of that kind of something. I think yeah. Well, I think this was a comment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much. And I will just say that I think I I wanted to say that the the, the spatialization of cannibalism I think is relevant. But it's it's not just a practice. It's a practice that takes place in particular locations, and so it has a spatial dimension. So it's in some ways, if you're having, if you're consuming mummy in Madrid, the spatialization of that also makes it not cannibalism in some ways. Right? Well, my question is: <laughs> Is cannibalism really as pervasive as they report? And part of the reason I'm one of the images you had was a uh, Theodore de Vries image. And I think that's from the Americas uh, series. And I think he's Dutch, and I think he's Protestant. Yes. And so I'm wondering, like, in this case, is this part of the black legend that this is actually this? Because there are other images of the Spaniards who means gold in there. I mean, how much of that is a Protestant uh, This is absolutely part of a particular polemic. So, I mean, Las Casas, of course, was writing within a Catholic tradition. He was a, you know, a Catholic writer who was criticizing Spanish colonization of the Indians from within a Catholic perspective. And he certainly used metaphors of, I mean, what he, you know, for him it was the Spaniards were like ravening wolves who were devouring the Indians, etc. De Bry illustrating this was a Protestant writer who was you know, was part of a larger polemic. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. So I completely agree that the debates were got re-tangled up in those same Reformation debates. But when you were saying how common was it? What was which was which how how common was was which? Whose whose cannibalism 
Yeah, well, I'm just wondering, you know, the, the sort of accusation of, the, I mean, in this case, I, mean, I think it's probably both. Like, I think that, you know, the Protestants are blowing this out of the water, right? Um, that they want there to be capitalism and dispatch to be capitalistic along with them. But I, I'm wondering is just, you know, is it something that's really going on or is it something that, for the Spanish, I mean, are they really seeing it everywhere because it's going on? Are they seeing it everywhere because they fear it's going on? Well, that is a vast debate, right? So, I mean, it was, I don't know, 1972 or something like that that William Ahrens published The Man-Eating Myth, in which he argued that there has never been any concrete evidence of real, actual cannibalism ever happening anywhere in the world. And then he kind of progressively toned it down and said, well, you know, there's not, not any really, really good evidence. He was sort of back, he walked away from that. And Subsequent generations of, you know, particularly ethnographers and anthropologists have produced all kinds of detailed, careful studies trying to dispute that. And I think we have well-attested examples of real life cases of real cannibalism in indigenous and European and non-indigenous cultures all over the place, etc. But I mean, I, would, I think I want to answer your question simply by saying that remains to some extent a topic of some polemic because it is clearly entangled in European disputes about the legitimacy of colonization, etc. So, um, no, no, I, I would merely say that, well, yeah, we're going. No, I just, I mean, there's probably no way to really find out. I just think it's really interesting to be thinking about, like, you know, how, how much are they, how much is it really an observation and how much it is uh, something, there's a, as your argument, that there's a reason why they want them to be cannibals for their own purposes. My, my personal view is that all of those things were going on, that there were a number of cultures that were engaging in, in, you know, in degrees of cannibalism, and that there were all kinds of reasons why the viewing, the discovery of cannibalism was overdetermined, was, you know, was, was inevitable, regardless of what everyone was doing. But, you know, I, yeah. I wonder, does human milk, where does uh, women nursing babies fit in? Well, breast milk is, is a concentrated form of humors. So, I mean, it certainly is a, is a human. That's a really interesting question. I've never read anybody describing that as a form of cannibalism. I, um, but there is, and again, I guess that was being alluded to in the, there was a mention of wet nursing in the afternoon session. Because breast milk is a purified form of blood and contains in a concentrated essence the humors of the lactating woman, if you are ingesting breast milk, I don't like to. <laughs> if you're ingesting breast milk, you are getting a concentrated dose of that woman's humoral balance, and that is why you are likely to take on her characteristics, which is why Jewish wet nurses or West African wet nurses or indigenous wet nurses were constantly being prescribed, proscribed as being you know, bad for the, you know, the European body. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe one more question. Okay. Um, if I understood what you know what what your main thrust was here, um, you indicated that at some point there was um, there were two different discourses at play uh, among the colonizers uh, in regard to the Eucharist and the ability of the indigenous people to participate. Uh, and that there was a strong element that said um, they can't do it because they're cannibals. And then you kind of closed your talk with this one uh, commentary. Um, and I'm wondering how it appears, from what I know of subsequent history, and I'm not mostly a you know, historian of the Americas, um, but it appears that the later um, interpretation is what became the predominant discourse. And I'm wondering what was the, um, how was that struggle played out and how did that become the predominant discourse so that you see um, it appears that the colonizers set up missions all over the place and they must have been thinking that these people could in fact become good Roman Catholics. Um, so how was that discourse uh, 
uh, thought out, and how did this last one become done? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that the, the really strong argument about whether indigenous people could become Christians from, from a feel, sort of within, within theological writings was, I think, a, lot, a 16th and early 17th century phenomenon. I, mean, I think by, the, by, the, by mid 17th century, I don't think that there were um, theological writings explaining how on these doctrinal grounds it was impossible for indigenous people to become Catholics. I think that, that dispute sort of ran its course. That didn't mean that there weren't plenty of people continuing to say, well, whatever the rules say, you know, it's not sticking, right? The same way that baptism might not stick to a Jewish body, whatever you might say about what it's supposed to be doing. So as a cultural belief, it, in, you know, it endured powerfully. As a theological debate, I think it ran up against the wall that the ultimately arguing that there were some people who could never, ever, ever become Christians was just so troubling to, to Catholic doctrine that it wasn't one that the church wanted to throw its weight behind. So the capacity of all human beings to, be, you know, to be, become um, Catholic was, you know, really remained fundamental. And so that, that intellectual debate, I think, was, well, let's say, lost. But as a cultural belief, I think it would do it. Is there any evidence that there was ever a papal edict or something like that or that tried to resolve that problem? Yeah, there were a whole bunch of papal edicts. I mean, starting with some of the ones in the early 16th century simply saying, I just want to put it on, you know, in writing that they're real people, indigenous people. So that was one of the earlier ones. That, so I mean, there were, you know, the, the first step was the Pope saying they're, they're humans, like everyone else. And then there were a whole series, I think that one's inter catera, right? yeah, that, yeah. Um, so there were, whether, I, whether there was a papal edict on whether indigenous people can take communion, I am not aware of that. But there were a whole series of kind of local manifestations of the Council of Trent. So the Council of Trent, for, um, for, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, was, was the sort of 16th century Catholic body that was set up in response to Martin Luther and the Reformation that worked for um, decades on com you know, kind of reviving the Catholic Church. And there were local manifestations of that in Peru and in Mexico, in the two viceregal centers. And there were a number of meetings of the Council of Lima, particularly, which issued a whole series of back and forth rulings on whether indigenous people could take communion over the course of the 16th century. So the highest ranking Catholic bodies in the Indies were issuing documents on that, ultimately saying yes. I, 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 you, you have to take control now. Yeah, I think we're going to call it because we're behind schedule and uh, okay. a chorus is waiting to sing. And so we need to move forward. But thank you, thank you so much. And let's uh, once again thank Dr. Owen.